Good to see that many people early in the morning on the third day of the conference. Actually, that's felt great. Uh, so we'll talk about kind of standard C++ toolset, whatever it means. I mean, like, uh, that's a little bit maybe tricky title because I personally do not believe we have a standard C++ toolset, but we'll try to find out if we have something at least close to it. So uh, we're going to talk about different aspects of the tools today and like what we have and what are the trends. So for those who don't know me, so my name is Anastasia Kazakova, so I work for JetBrains. Before JetBrains, I spent uh, eight years in like C and C++ development for embedded systems. We're mostly doing like telecom, networking devices. We were doing the policy controller for 4G LTE networks. So all kind of, you know, funny stuff <laughs> when you launch the 4G network for the first time in the country. That was fun. But then I moved to JetBrains. I mostly do not... I don't do like C++ in production code. I'm working as a product marketing manager, but with my C++ background, just try and help the team and do our best for C++ developers. And you can find me on Twitter, and um, I'm always ready to answer any questions you have around the tools or just like talks or whatever. Um, so let's try and figure out what is actually the tool set, at least like how I do understand it. I'll try to explain it right now. So. For me, the tool set, actually, that's all the tools we have for the language, like literally everything. However, you can split them into essential tools and, as I call them, complementary tools. Essential tools are the tools without which you actually can't develop because you can't do any C++ development without a compiler because you actually need to compile the code yeah, and like to then to run it. So standard library is also essential to me. You kind of can and try deal without it. I mean, like, game developers used to use their own standard library. That's fine. They has this experience. But usually, you kind of need at least something from the standard library. So uh, I do count standard library as an essential tooling here. Um, project model and build systems. Again, it's like you might deal with just compilation flags and just compile your code, but it's much easier, especially if you have a huge project to deal with like project model or some build system, at least something. To, so you just don't write all your compilation flags in the command line for the huge projects. Um, dependency manager, again, I do count it as an essential, even though if that means for you just put your library into the project. So you at least doing some dependency manager. So you're finding the proper package with the proper version, put it maybe into your source code, compile it with the whole source code. That's also kind of dependency manager. Maybe not the best way to deal with it, but still. And like, yeah, the debugger here again. So you might be debugging with like printing some variable values. That's also like debugging techniques. There's also something you use and like the language might help you and the tool set might help you with some like maybe standalone debugger, but that's still essential tooling. <clears throat> Analyzer is like complementary tool. So you literally don't need it if you just build the code and run it so or debug it. Uh, it's Better if you have it and you like running the code checks and you like trying to figure out if you may be running into some potential issues. Uh, and all that, like the other stuff, like unit testing framework and all the other tools, they're very, very important, but I also count them as complementary. That doesn't mean that you don't need them, but just you can survive without them on the first stage, but later you still might need them. Let's briefly see how the other languages are doing. So just uh, a brief uh, overview across like maybe a couple of languages. So Java, uh, it has actually, I would say one compiler like Chavak is, uh, either you take it from the like Oracle official runtime or GDK, it doesn't matter, the compiler is literally the same. They were, uh, like, there are actually a few more compilers for Java. They are not that popular. The most popular one probably is the Eclipse compiler for Java, and I wanted to mention it here because it's very specific. It was especially created for the ID needs, so it's quite close to my heart. I kind of understand what they were trying to achieve there because the biggest uh, features of this uh, ECG compiler were probably that they can run the code, which has some blocks which doesn't compile, so it's fine. Uh, so, and also it can do the incremental builds, and since this was actually created for the ID for Eclipse, so uh, by the time you finish writing the code, 
it will be already compiled. So that was kind of uh, compiler close to the language engine uh, in the IDE. So it's close how the regular la language engines are working inside the IDEs. So it's a little bit different from the regular compiler philosophy, but kind of uh, close to, yeah, to IDE needs. So that was done by Eclipse. I guess they kind of abandoned it. So it still exists, but they're not uh, like putting too much efforts in it. So uh, Java class library is rich. And like usually when the people uh, feel envy in C++, they usually feel envy towards you know um, Java because they have this huge library and they can literally get anything out of it. Um, in terms of uh, build systems and project models, so they still have several. Like um, Ant is kind of more or less abandoned, so I'm, I, it's like used by a small portion of Java developers. Like Maven and Gradle are the top two, probably, and Maven is kind of more popular, but still Gradle has its audience. So the numbers are quite different. Like 20% came from our JetBrains developer ecosystem, and 49% came from JRebel survey. I guess both are biased, so the truth is somewhere in between. So I put it just uh, through the dash. Um, yeah, and JUnit is just like if you need to do the tests with uh, Java, like some basic tests, you just take the JUnit. Um, Ruby, it's a little bit tricky because like it doesn't need a compiler kind, it's an interpreter, so it's a different philosophy. Uh, they have like several of them, uh, and they have, uh, because that's like, you can do an interpreter, you can do JIT, and you can do some other techniques here. There are like, several implementations. So MRI is the original implementation for Ruby internal from the like Ruby offer. It's also called CRuby. Uh, YARV is like yet another Ruby VM. I guess that's something which the um, Ruby offer is right now developing. So it's some new thing, like JRuby for GVM, Ruby News based on LVM, like Iron Ruby for .NET, so there were several implementations. Uh, interesting fact, I don't know how many of you know what the Rails singularity means for Ruby. Anyone here? No? Okay, so um, you probably have heard that there is this Ruby on Rails framework. It's very popular, I mean like it's used by 86 or something like that percent of the Ruby developers. And it's very complex. It has some, um, it uses some Ruby specific features, quite many of them, and it's actually hard to compile it properly. And so Ruby, like Rails singularity for Ruby means, so if you can compile Ruby on Rails, then like your compiler is good enough. And as far as I know, there are just not that many compilers that pass, uh, pass the test. It's just MRI and YARF, and also I guess uh, like JRuby and Rubinius. So the others are kind of good, but they are not passing the rail singularity. So Ruby developers, they just don't take them seriously. If the compiler doesn't pass that, they don't need it. Um, anyway, like uh, they have a fantastic package management approach. So they have Ruby gam games, uh, they have Bundler, which I guess it was a third party tool, but it's somehow now the official part of the ecosystem. And it's used like by 90% of the Ruby developers. Um, and yeah, a respect for tests. They al also have some other frameworks, uh, but that just depend on the frameworks and specific areas you are using the Ruby at. Uh, Swift, uh, it's a fantastic example from Apple. I mean like Apple just maintains everything. I mean like they have the Swift tool chain, you just get it from Apple. Uh, you have the Swift compiler, it's like, LVM based, but you'd better take it like from this Swift tool chain. And the same story with actual LDB, so you uh, can't use just a regular LDB. You have to take the Swift tool chain, take the compiler from it, take the debugger from it, and everything just working like a charm for you. <clears throat> they have source kit, which is like a uh, language server protocol, and there are lots of analyzers, and the source kit is like uh, also providing some code analysis, and you can build some tooling on top of it. There is this approach for Swift when you can actually not just debug your code, but you can like play around it with the playgrounds or uh, redevelop print loop approach when you just, you know, uh, it's kind of like an interpreter. So you play with the code and it's uh, got interpreted and you see the result. Um, Swift Package Manager, SPM, was specifically created for Swift. Cocoa Pods are still popular, but the main reason, I guess, is that they were the top package manager for Objective-C, Objective-C++, and the people just keep using it for Swift. But I see the trend that the Swift developers who came from Objective-C background and who are using Cocoa Pods, they are kind of migrating to SPM because SPM is official. So everyone were expected, actually, that when the Swift were anno uh, was announced, everyone 
uh, I guess was expecting Apple to buy the company behind the cacao pots and just, you know, get it official. But surprisingly, they didn't do that. So they maintained their SPM. And so now there are two, but I guess SPM will kind of win in the future. Um, unfortunately, cacao pots is actually quite nice. And like, yeah, Exitest is just the main framework. And the example which is closer to like our house as C++ developers, and which I think is a perfect example here, because to me, Rust ecosystem in terms of the tool set is kind of ideal. I mean, you have Rust C compiler, that's it, that's just one compiler. You have Carga, which is a build system and also a package manager. I mean, like, it does incredible job for you. So it downloads, compiles, distributes, uploads all the packages. So you don't have actually to care about anything. So it takes the packages from the official reg uh, like registry. It like compiles everything in your project. So you just say like I need this package of like this version. Um, Rust FMT a very popular formatter. They also have kind of standard. Uh, Rust analyzer that's again the LSP thing like the language server protocol uh, based analyzer. Um, Interesting fact that due to our surveys, like 60% of the Rust developers, they do debug via the printing function or via the special uh, debug macro, which Rust has. So they kind of also has the proper, uh, they have the proper standalone debugger, but they're mostly not using it. And yeah, the, the, uh, for tests, they just uh, enable the special model for cargo and just use it. So this ecosystem is very, very simple and straightforward. And in terms of the C++ tool set, so you, you might feel about Rust differently, but the tool set is actually ideal. I mean, like, they have everything very, very standard, very open to everyone. So it's not like, for, for Swift, it's also standard, but it's maintained by Apple, and you, like, never know how it goes, and it's just their decision. For Rust, it's more, like, open to the community, but still standard, which is good. Um, why at all the standard uh, tool set matters, actually? <coughs> and the easy question, because it helps you to start quicker with the language. Because when, the, uh, when like, someone new is coming to the language or to the project, you just enable everything, you set the development environment easily, like uh, maybe it's a Docker container or some other way to distribute the standard um, environment. You just enable everything, and the person is just using some standard thing he or she got used to, so there are no like questions if this compiler working differently or how to work with this build system. I've never worked with it. So standard uh, tool set kind of makes the things easier. Um, it helps with some like unifications and like indeed makes the onboarding much easier. And also it helps with adoption of the good practices because when you have a standard unit testing framework, or maybe even a couple, but they are kind of standard. You know how to use them through like some official package managers with some like um, build system which everyone around you like is using, then it's easier for you to start. Because if to start with the unit tests, you need to, you know, spend a couple of hours digging through the whole internet trying to find a proper unit testing framework, then for a couple of hours trying to learn how to enable it, big chances somewhere in the middle you will just say, okay, I don't need unit tests at all. Um, so standard tool set indeed makes life a little bit easier and like kind of increases the chances that you'll be using like good tooling and good practices. It doesn't mean that it has to be just one tool for everything. No, but you just ha need to have kind of standard tool set even if there are like several tools for the purposes. So um, yeah, and if you don't have, you have like some conflicts and inconsistencies which uh, like makes your life harder and uh, you probably don't want that from the tool set. Uh, let's talk about some interesting thing here about like some uh, things not directly related to maybe the tool set as like compiler, debugger, build system, but uh, some other types of inconsistencies you might run into C++ and uh, if you don't have a standard approach here, you also might run into trouble or at least you need some tools which will help you. Um, and this is like the syntax style and um, I like this thing about C++ actually, that we can do things in different ways. So that we uh, have many opportunities to express ourselves, but sometimes the issue is that expressing ourselves in different ways 
inside one project, inside one team, makes the things uh, difficult for our colleagues. And the typical examples is the syntax style in C++ where we have different approaches to writing the code. Like uh, just four examples here, like almost uh, always outer approach when you try to put, you know, outer specifier almost everywhere or like the uh, opposite camp which says that like, yeah, when the type is evident, we have to put the outer uh, and not in other cases or don't do that for numeric types. So this just the uh, several ways of using the outer across your code. Then also, yeah, this is like kind of very known like West const vs East const. You probably have heard about it. So that's about the way where to place const specifier before or after the type it applies to. So also two different ways of writing const. Uh, trailing return type um, approach is interesting because trailing return type appeared like mostly for expressing the type for lambdas, but then some people say like maybe we have to use it everywhere. I mean, and we have to convert our like regular return type into the trailing return type for the function. And there are people who say in the, like, no, we have to use it only like for these cases where we can't live without it, or we have to use it everywhere. Um, and yeah, sometimes it even comes to different uh, styles used in different areas. Like an example is that C++ core guidelines, they say, that when you override a function, you have to put either override or like final, and you don't have to put virtual. And Unreal Engine's gui uh, guiding standard, like which is used by Unreal Engine uh, game engine, uh, they explicitly say that uh, virtual has to be put explicitly. Well, you don't need it, but like the guidelines say that you have to do that. And it's interesting because they are completely conflicting with the core guidelines here. Uh, so anyway, like uh, when we decided to support all these syntax style rules, the, actually the list of settings is twice longer. It just doesn't fit to the, uh, to the slide. I mean, I just wanted to show you that we have many, many things in the syntax style which we can do differently. So, and in terms of the standard tool set, you need to have like, in this case, it's mostly the analyzer, which will be checking these rules for you. Um, if you want some standard approach across the whole code base. Because like, if someone is using these rules differently in the same code base, it's probably not good. Um, so yeah, for that, you kind of need some tool which will be applying the standard approach. And so like doing the things like, um, like yeah, for example, converting the trailing to the trailing return type for you automatically, maybe. Um, like, Another thing here about the package management struggle, I think like we all know about it, but just to show you some statistics. So that came from a developer ecosystem survey by Chairbrains from 2021. So when we asked people uh, how do they manage the third party libraries in C++, uh, you can kind of see that like one uh, fourth of the developers, they just have the library source code as part of their build. So like, and I guess the package managers are these numbers in the bottom. I mean, like VC package and Conan and whatever the people use, like some NuGet, some build to approach. But like most of the people, they just rely on a system package manager or just try to download some pre-built libraries <coughs> or just like, yeah, compile the libraries uh, through their um, instructions. Okay. So C++, where are we actually now with the tool set? Let's try to figure out. I have to say that for the C++ tool set, to explain it, I really like this slide from Bryce talk from C++ Now, uh, where he was showing like the, he was talking about the standard library. So again, some kind of st standard tool set here is the standard library and what actually belongs to it. And he was talking about the universality of the language and how C++ is used in different areas and he, the language has to adopt to all these platforms, all these paradigms, and all these like types of uh, problems the users are solving. So for that, for sure, we probably can't just have one, you know, standard set of tools like one standard compiler, one standard build system. I don't think it's possible because we are solving different types of problems. So um, in that sense, for example. Rust is mostly used for like some small utilities or some specific like types of applications. So it's not used like for this variety of applications. So maybe for Rust it's okay to have these standard tool set, but for C++, I don't think uh, we'll be able to unify to that extent and probably we don't need that. 
Um, interestingly, back in 20, uh, 2015, so when we were starting our C++ tools at JetBrains, um, we were kind of young and naive, but we were trying to make uh, the tools right, so we started tools creation from the survey. So we actually were uh, trying to do some research on what is the standard tool set people are using because we needed it for prioritization. So we needed to start with something in the tool, and we saw the whole variety of like build system, compilers, debuggers, and we say, uh, we said, okay, like we we will do the survey, we will do the research, we'll try to we'll try to figure out like the popular uh, set of like compiler, build tool, and debugger, and we'll start with it, and then the others will come later. And so at that time, for us, the winner was like GCC, CMake, and GDB. Uh, it like changed quite um, quite fast after we started the tools. Like Clang started to grow significantly, um, but like, yeah, at that time, so for, for sure, like on Mac, the set was different. It was Clank on Mac for sure. So we started doing Clank at the same time as GCC support, so that was fine for us. But generally, yeah, uh, it was interesting to, uh, interesting experience to figure out what is the standard tool set. Um, okay, so since I started talking about the compilers, um, Actually, in C++, we have quite many compilers, and that's not all of them here. So uh, maybe just to name, uh, you know, the, the biggest names. So obviously, we have like Clank, GCC, and MSVC, and also Intel compiler, which now exists like in two versions, like Intel old compiler and Intel based on LVM. So it's kind of Clank, but with Intel optimizations. Um, so they migrated uh, quite recently to LVM architecture, uh, like to LVM uh, backend for the compiler. So they have their reasons for that, uh, partially because they see how LVM evolves in terms of the new language feature support, and they just probably don't want to support everything from scratch inside Intel compiler, but just want to do their specific uh, optimizations. And of course, there is a huge pack of the uh, embedded compilers, compilers for embedded development. I'm just, you know, uh, naming here like Kale and IR, which are like probably the two big compilers in this area, but there are many, many compilers. There are like GCC-based compilers and some specific compilers from the vendors. There are lots of them. Like I came from the embedded area and I know like how different these compilers could be. And um, sometimes they are not compatible uh, with like the compilers we know in general, like GCC or Clang. Okay, so but what uh, do developers actually use? So these, this is actually quite new statistic. This is coming from 2022 survey. We haven't published the results yet. They will be coming somehow in maybe a month or so, but I already took the numbers from it. So these are the numbers from this year. So and uh, in terms of the compiler, it's not a surprise that GCC is winning because there are many people who are like using GCC-based compiler, especially in like embedded. So they are like selecting GCC here, Clang uh, and Clang CL. Uh, this year we actually put it as a separate compiler because we had many questions before if I should select Clang or MSVC if I'm using Clang CL, and that's a good question actually. So I decided just to put it as a separate option. Um, in, like and Intel is also split into two, and you can see that Intel LVM is actually adoption is growing quite fast. I mean, like I would expect that they will be much bigger next year, uh, and the regular Intel will probably fall down because uh, Intel themselves they encourage people to migrate to the new compiler. Uh, and yeah, some like more specific compilers for microcontrollers. I just aggregated all of them here to this seven uh, percent, and some custom compilers, uh, whatever it means, to three percent. Interestingly, like the story with the compilers in C++ is that we have different defaults on different like operation systems. Like, obviously on Linux you are more about GCC. On macOS you kind of used to Clang, but like Apple Clang is not regular Clang. I mean, like it's completely different. It's usually like way behind the uh, Clang you can just download and build on your machine, and it has like some uh, Apple stuff in it. But that's at least the uh, compiler you get with your like uh, operation system with Xcode, with Xcode build tools. You just have it, uh, so you don't need to install anything specifically. And I don't think there is like a default for Windows. I mean, like Microsoft compiler is kind of default, but you need first to install it, so it's not coming with the Windows installation for you. And there are other options for Windows, but like they they are not 
that nicely working like min, uh, MinGW and Sigwin is usually a pain if you're trying to configure them. Like, not just compile a simple hello world, but just do some st regular stuff. I mean, have some libraries, you always struggle if that's uh, the case. Uh, like Clang CL, yeah, is mostly popular if you would like to use Clang on Windows. <coughs> it's now actually possible to use Clang from just LVM on Windows without like big issues with the libraries and Windows age and whatever, uh, but it's still a pain to configure it properly. Actually, you need to use some MCs libraries and the stuff. Um, yeah, so, and I have to say that if you take game dev uh, area, for example, the Microsoft compiler will be dominating the market. Like it's used across the whole game dev. So all game dev engines are relying on uh, MS built. They are doing their work with Microsoft compiler and you easily you can't easily compile with Clang because you will have the console SDK, which is not like compilable with Clang, for example. It's quite often is compilable just with MSVC, so just uh, no one in the game dev will be trying that. I mean, like there are a few attempts, like Unreal Engine actually announced that you can compile with Clang on Windows because you can actually use Clang on other platforms, so why not try and compile on Windows? But that's a pain, I mean, in terms of the libraries. <coughs> okay. Um, a few other things about how the compilers are different. Uh, the easy thing is the compiler options. And like while GCC and Clang, they are very similar in terms of options, like Microsoft compiler is completely different. An easy thing, if you try to enable Viol V Extra, you do that differently for Microsoft compiler and GCC and Clang compiler. So if you know how to do that for one compiler, that doesn't mean that you know how to do that for other. And that's usually a pain for people. I mean, like, unification of the options kind of help uh, because, like, if you know th how the options work for one compiler, then you probably can just apply your knowledge to another compiler. Um, in terms of the C++ standard support, the story is even more interesting because, like, for a very, very long time, adoption in Clang were just uh, blazingly fast for the new features. But with C++ 20, somehow, Microsoft is ahead of others right now, so it's literally nearly got everything in this table, just few features left, while GCC and Clang are still behind. And that happened, I guess, mostly with C++20, so I haven't observed this big trend before that Microsoft is actually doing great work of adopting the C++20. And uh, yeah, I guess probably just because they really need it. <laughs> I mean, like, uh, when you really need something and you're maintaining the compiler, probably you can, yeah, uh, boost the development. And the Clang and GCC, kind of behind, hopefully they, they will uh, catch up, so they are more or less doing that, but still. But uh, I think about the Clang is actually, it's not just a compiler. So compared to like if you take GCC or if you take MSVC, Clang is actually a whole ecosystem of LVM which is used in other tools in many ways. Like there is libclang and clangd and this language server protocol which is used often by vendors like us in IDEs when we maintain some other tooling based on this uh, clangd because it actually provides you a nice AST like uh, syntax tree from which you can uh, you can navigate through it and do some um, maybe changes like refactorings or something based on it. So it's a nice provider and a nice language engine. And it's often used these days. I mean, like uh, nearly all modern C++ IDEs except uh, like Visual Studio are using uh, Clang Clang D actually now to some extent, maybe not as the main language engine, but at least as a complementary language engine. Like we do that for C line. Uh, in ReSharper, we only using like Clang Tidy, not as a language engine, um, but just as an analyzer. But uh, literally everyone uh, like does that. Uh, because it's easier to maintain, like the community maintains the language engine kind of for you because they bring the new features for you and you just have to do your work on top. Clang Analyzer and Clang Tidy are uh, kind of the most popular tools for analyzing the C++ code. I also like part of this ecosystem, like Clang Format, um, like IDEs, as I told you before. So yeah, everything that actually needs the AST, they are using the Clang ecosystem right now and this infrastructure, and that's good. <coughs> so yeah, Clang is kind of a basis for the rest of the C++ tools. So it's not just a compiler. Okay, so what's going on with the build systems? Let's take a look. 
kind of an obvious picture right now. Uh, it was not like that seven years ago. Like CMake was very, very close uh, to like Amos build and make files, but right now it's used by the majority of the C++ developers. There are still people who are only using others. Like again, game dev is targeted on like Windows ecosystem. So it's about Amos build like and like Microsoft compiler. Embedded developers are more about make files and like auto tools. So they started uh, using uh, CMake, but it's not uh, like the top tool for them right now. Um, the others like are kind of like in behind. Bazel has its like audience, mostly driven by like Google. Uh, Mason also has some audience and like some others. Um, so yeah. And if you see how it all evolved through the years, you can see a huge boost for CMake, which happened at some point of time. So these uh, here I just collected the developer ecosystem results from 2017 to 2022 which we like maintain for all these years and how it all changed. And you can actually notice that in the beginning, in 2017, MS Build was the top uh, project model build system for C++. But then the, C++, uh, the CMake has started growing blazingly fast and it's now like a top. And uh, I wanted just to quote Bryce from the same talk from C++ Now uh, when he was talking about the standard library. So like you want a standard C++ build system, you got one, it's called CMake. You may like it or dislike, but it's it's kind of standard. So we still have others for different cases. It might be uh, bigger usage like in game dev, but it's kind of standard. And if we talk about the CMake adoption and how it's actually adopted um, across um, like different tools, <clears throat> I see now that there are more libraries coming to CMake, so quite often if you find an open source library uh, on GitHub, quite likely uh, there will be some CMake in there, so you can kind of try and maintain it uh, and use it via the CMake. Package managers are also like good friends of CMake, like both Conan and VC package are. IDs are now supporting CMake I guess all of them, I mean like Microsoft added CMake support and actually evolves it a lot. So it's like, uh, I mean like, it's not like I must build in Visual Studio, but it's like a good quality of support for CMake and all the others, like we started our IDEs, like we started C-Line from scratch on CMake. So it's like the first citizens um, and like others also have support for CMake a lot. Uh, Qt actually migrated in Qt 6 from QMake to CMake. That was a big move for them. So they kind of abandoned uh, QMake uh, and moved to CMake. Embedded developers, surprisingly, finally moved into CMake as well. Like they were mostly about make files and outer tools, but you can um, Notice right now this trend like uh, the Zephyr AirTOS. So AirTOS, these like open source real time operating systems. Uh, so it's on CMake. Nordic Semiconductor, who are providing these NRF uh, microcontrollers, they're very popular for, for example, if you use the Bluetooth mouse, quite often that's a Nordic Semiconductor microcontroller inside. So uh, they actually migrated the whole SDK to CMake. So that, that was a huge move for them a couple of years ago. Uh, Boost even had some you know, CMake effort didn't make it, so they kind of abandoned the effort, but at least they tried, I mean, like, good try. <laughs> um, CMake file API was actually a huge move for CMake because that uh, gave an opportunity for every tool vendor to work properly with CMake, because before that, when you were working with CMake, you had to actually run the whole CMake and like, you know, parse the output. But CMake file API is actually this black box which tells you all the information about the project. And like, for example, if you integrate in CMake into your IDE, you just communicate with CMake via the CMake file API. And that's much better, much easier, and like uh, you have just less errors because you are doing the proper API calls, not parsing some you know creepy output. And CMake presets were actually a huge milestone for CMake, which I do hope will 
like just give another boost to CMake even more because the presets actually, if you don't know, that's a way to configure your CMake in some standard way which you can share with your colleagues. So you just have these presets files and you just describe what tool chain you're using there so how you like all this configuration and build uh, steps in the CMake are done and you can just share these files into the repository. There are like two types of files. The two types of files you can share in the rep repository and then your local files so you still can do some customization for your local case. The presets were driven by Microsoft again a lot. There was a huge collaboration between Microsoft and uh, Kitware, and uh, presets were released in like, I guess, more than a year ago already, so maybe a couple of years already. Um, and they evolve, somehow they're still young, I mean they still break the compatibility with every new version of the presets. So it's hard to, you know, kind of uh, migrate from one preset version to another. <coughs> I guess it's four or five already. The fifth version of the preset, I guess, is the, the latest one right now, but I, I might be wrong. Uh, so yeah, but it's, it's the easy way to uh, have the configurable builds which you can share across the team. So it's a good way to configure. And, uh, but CMake is a language, uh, sorry saying this for the record, but it's crap. I mean, like, as a language, it's really hard. Uh, it's good for quizzes, literally. And I remember the fantastic talk from Mateusz, and you probably noticed CPP Now is one of my favorite conferences. I like a lot of talks from it. But Mateusz from IPAM, he was doing a talk several years ago at the <coughs> online version of CPP Now, uh, it was called like CMake and Conan three years later and first part of the talk he dedicated to the quiz. And I have to blame myself, I tried to do that, but I failed completely. I mean like he was asking questions about like if you set this variable to this value and then you do like uh, uh, if class operator with this value, what would be the uh, result? I mean like to realize that in a language you have like ignore not found and off values working as false, that, that's a hard language. But like if you cook it right, then it gives you the power, but it's like in terms of the language, it's not easy. And if, uh, to confirm that it's not easy, I have to say that in C line recently, we actually released a CMake debugger. Just imagine you have a build system for which you need a debugger to write a proper build system code, but the people actually need it. It's one of the most popular feature of the recent release we are now doing because the people say, oh, we now have a debugger. We can just debug the CMA code, like see the values of the variables, like all the targets, environment variables, and we also like inlining some values in the editor, and now it's much easier to understand what's going on in my CMA code. Like, yeah, it's a good helper, but like, yeah, we need a debugger for the build system, it's hard. <coughs> okay, um, another story I like can't avoid here is CMake and Modulus, because uh, C++ 20 Modulus, great feature, but to adopt it, we need the tools. And I see some kind of a disappointment in the community because when we first asked the people in developer ecosystem survey a couple of years ago when just the standard was released, uh, which big features of the C++ 20 you're gonna use quite soon, like in the next six months, the majority was selecting modulus. So there was a huge excitement. And now when we ask them, like concepts are kind of trending because the people are, okay, we'll wait for tools because they realize that they can't use modulus. It's a great feature, but they don't have any tooling. Um, but some people do the, the, the great uh, work here. So, um, like, uh, compilers actually started implementing modulus, but that was not enough because the people were like, okay, I have to put some shitty compiler flags, how to do that properly, it doesn't work for me reliably, and it differs from one compiler to another compiler. So they were kind of waiting for the build system to support it. It was the build tool first, I guess, which kind of they announced that they have some support and they have some working example, but I don't think that many people are using build tool. Uh, but when CMake said that, yeah, they're doing some job towards modulus, that was a bigger excitement. And with, together with Microsoft, they finally released this kind of approach when you can use CMake plus Visual Studio Generator, and then you can kind of build modulus. But it's a little bit tricky way because you just build them as regular C++ files. You don't get what's going on with these models because you're just trying to build modulus files with your regular source files, and then some magic happens inside, 
Um, so probably not a very straightforward way if you want to understand how you build your models and what, what you're actually doing there. Okay, let's take compiler flux. Uh, so we actually, this is a working example. It works with Clank for us. Uh, I failed actually to make a working example with GCC, to be honest with you. I followed all the instructions how to build models with GCC compiler flux, at least on Mac, and I felt it doesn't work for me. Maybe I'm doing something wrong. So, but for Clank, that kind of works. So, like, you just put all kind of creepy flags and you kind of build a model, and then you get, like, everything. Um, there is, like, not a very big CMake. There's just one function out of it. But you can do that. Um, there are some issues. I mean, like, I recently ran into issue with the Clank compiler when I was building model uh, models on my Mac. Uh, <clears throat> and then I updated the Mac OS, and it got some, like, uh, new target architecture um, when building the modulus. I removed the whole build directory where everything was built. I mean, like, literally cleaned everything, just, you know, deleted, and tr was trying to rebuild it from scratch, and I still got some conflicts of the architectures between the modulus and my source files. I don't know why. It looks like Clank was just saving some information somewhere outside of my project. I have no idea where, so I just put uh, the proper architecture as a compiler flag and forced it to rebuild the model with this architecture. But that looks like a bug to me in the, it was like Clank 15, so hopefully they will address it. Uh, but at least you can do that. And even better, CMake just released 3.25, uh, like literally this week. The release candidate was just a couple of weeks ago. And they released it with, like, quite silently at the stage of release candidate. They just added some modular support there. It was not in the release notes. We just noticed that there were some examples which appeared on the CMake site. And then in the release, they finally announced it. So these are the working example, actually, from CMake. Uh, we made it work. So we made it like uh, work um, on, I guess, at least Windows, maybe Mac as well. I don't remember. Maybe not all the platforms. But yeah, it's kind of working. Uh, they have more examples uh, in the repository. So you can actually now build models uh, for CMake, you can notice this creepy file set variable. And I do not understand their like approach, but they just put all models file into some variable they called file set. And that's where you have the models. I don't know where the naming is coming from, while file set. And uh, we were very much surprised because they didn't propagate this variable to the CMake file API in 3.25. They fixed it for 3.26. So uh, we don't get this information in like ID, for example, from the CMake file API with 3.25. But like, yeah, seems they're doing some work around it. So maybe it's not the best attempt from them, but like it works. Um, okay. Um, now, like coming from the build system to the dependency managers, because they're kind of close. Uh, this is like similar da data I was showing before, but I will just add some uh, historical data here. Uh, like, not the historical, but the, sorry, the areas split, because I wanted to show you what is the situation in the embedded, because this is the area where uh, which kind of shows like the blue is the overall data and the green is the data from the embedded developers. And you can see that there are even less using the uh, some like standard tool, not the standard tools, but like some tools like VC package or Conan. So they're more like compiling all their things uh, as part of their builds. And they have lots of libraries and many of them are distributed by the vendor. So I guess you can actually try and put this into the package manager from the vendor because the libraries are kind of provided by the vendor and they're more or less standard, at least um, as a, some specific version. So it's interesting to me if they actually move because I think if Embedded tries to do that and tries to move to uh, package management, I guess that will drive the package management for others as well uh, because, like, mm, yeah, these people, if they move to something new, that's uh, a huge step. Um, about a little bit more about the other tools I have to say here. <coughs> so Clank format, and it's literally the standard formatting tools right now. So if you find any repository on GitHub, quite often you have the Clank format con con config file in it. So you just download the repository, you run Clank format, and you get the same formatting as the author uh, of the repository 
or the team behind it uh, were having in mind. And that's good, actually, so that you can have this standard formatting. Uh, there are some interesting things about the Clang format that while it is the part of the LVM ecosystem, it still has this fuzzy parser. So uh, to have the performance benefits, they are kind of not using the proper parsing uh, like the Clang compiler. So, And sometimes some people can notice the differences. I mean, like you compile the things in one way, but then you understand the Clang format treats it differently. And the people even got used to it. And now if you like, if in our tools, sometimes we do not call the Clang format directly, but just mimic it. So like uh, mapping the um, config file and then call, calling our own formatter with the same settings. And we realize that we are doing the things differently. And the people say like, oh no, the Clang format behaves differently. So you have to behave like the Clang format. And we're like, okay, we're just trying to behave like a normal compiler who just parsed the code correctly. But probably we have to fix that for you because you got used to how the Clang format does that. Um, and also, like, the big issue with the Clang format is that they are breaking compatibility between versions, and that even come to, uh, quite often comes uh, to the situation when they have the parameter, for example, which had in the config file values like yes or no, and then it was converted to some enum value next version. So the, your config file is completely broken. So you have to use the proper version of the Clang format for which this config file was created, because otherwise, quite often, you are running into issues. And I know many companies who are saying to us, like, uh, yeah, we're using the specific version of the Clang format. We are stick to it because otherwise we have issues with the compatibility. Uh, <clears throat> okay, like my favorite topic is code analysis. Um, I like it a lot. And uh, this is also the data from this year. The question we ask is what kind of the code analysis tools and guideline uh, enforcement you are using. And like the majority of the people are using either none, which is set, or the ID built-in, which is good, because the IDs can now do a good job for you and they have lots of tools built-in, so you just rely on what the tools provide to you. That's fine. I mean, like Visual Studio or our tools, we have lots of um, code analysis tooling um, built-in, so you can just rely on it. And like, yeah, no surprise that the LVM ecosystem is dominating for the rest, like Clank Tidy. Clang format, which people still consider like a code analysis, while it's not. Uh, Clang analyzer, and then comes the rest. I actually cut those uh, analyzers which have uh, like less than 3%, but there are quite many of them as well. Like there are com more coming here. Um, okay, so um, talking about the uh, code analysis, like indeed the Clang tidy is kind of baseline. So many, many people are using Clang Tidy. It's integrated in many tools. Uh, you can now even, maybe you don't know that you're using Clang Tidy, but you're using it. I mean, like, if it's integrating into your IDE, you might have uh, noticed that there are some checks, but you maybe even don't know if they're coming from Clang Tidy or some other analyzer. You just have them. That's good. Uh, there is, they have like lots of checks, like modernized checks or core guidelines checks or some specific checks like submitted to Google. And the good thing about the Clang Tidy is that you can actually do some custom check, which is great. I mean, like you can write your custom check in your company and then build the custom binary of your Clang Tidy with your custom check, put it to like some uh, tool in storage you have, and uh, like run this Clang Tidy on your like CI or a developer's machine every time and have your specific checks. Th this is is great, so th this is a good thing. Um, also, like in the modern tooling with the um, code analysis, you can now have the great, uh, like, lots of information coming out of the data flow analysis. More, more and more tools are now trying to integrate data flow analysis. So we started in our tools, like in C-Line uh, several years ago. I know others who are doing the data flow analysis. So, and it's literally the code analysis which goes beyond the compiler uh, like abilities because it analyzes the possible values and how they uh, flow through the code. So you can do that inside the function scope or you can do that inside the translation unit scope. Like uh, in C line, we are doing uh, like local as function scope or global as translation unit scope, but there is even a like proof of concept how to do this uh, cross translation unit analysis. There is a um, checker from Ericsson which they presented at some of the uh, LVM meeting long time ago. And l there is like some description on how to do that in Clang. So it's not like widely used by any known um, 
code analyzer, but at least there is a proof of concept that you can do that uh, cross-translation unit. Uh, but usually, yeah, it's mostly in the scope of the translation unit. And you can actually check and look for many things here. So the DFA, so it actually takes into account like the function parameters and arguments, the return values, the filling global variables, and it actually outputs the value ranges for the variables. And later you can do these uh, assumptions like you possibly have like a dangling pointer, or there are issues with lifetimes, or the index is out of scope, or there is an unreachable code, or endless loop, or endless recursion, whatever. So you can do these checks on top of this knowledge. <coughs> also, in terms of code analysis, so like there are lots of, uh, for C++ and like C, there is lots of analyzers uh, for which are domain specific. And that's good because like if you're working with Qt, for example, you have Clazy, which not just takes the general C++ code, but it understands all these signals the Qt has, so, and you're doing the checks based on this like meta information about what it actually is. Or like in Unreal Engine, there is Unreal Header tool, which understands this uh, macro system which Unreal Engine is using for reflection because yeah, we still don't have a reflection in the language, so all the game engines are just struggling and using some some implementations. So Unreal Engine uses macros, and they have this uh, specific analyzer, which uh, is kind of using this meta information about what these macros are, what they have to have, and just provide you some maybe possible warnings. And there are lots of analyzers specific to embed it. I mean, like, there are lots of checkers. And of course, like, we are actually good at doing code analysis because we have, like, some tools on CI. Like, there is a very popular tools from Sonar Source. Um, so we also started doing at JetBrains also some tools like Kadana, which is also code analysis on CI. And that's actually a different type of the workflow. So it's not just like you're working as a developer with your code and you would like to run some checks. Probably you don't need to run them on CI unless they're uh, like platform specific and you can't do that on the local machine or they're just quite greedy in terms of resources or time and then you probably need to run them on CI. But quite often CI checks are just the health check for the whole project. So like you have the project and then you have the constant code analysis running like maybe daily or once per week on the CI and someone in the team, uh, I would say like some manager, I mean like tech lead or someone, so is checking how the project is doing, so what, uh, what's happening there. So this is kind of a management and health check tool. And it's good for open source projects, like if everyone is just contributing to it and you have some constant um, CI configured, so you run the code analysis just to make sure that the project is doing good. And so these tools which work with code analysis on CI, quite often they help uh, annotating like the uh, pull requests and uh, like helping you to uh, to do the things or like do some code reviews for them. And actually, uh, I talk a lot about it in the different talks, so you can uh, take a look at my talk from C++ Now, and I guess soon will be the recording on the new version from NDC Tech Town, where I have the whole talk dedicated to code analysis in uh, modern C++, so I don't want to spend more time on this uh, right now. And maybe just a few slides I would like to discuss in the end is about the unit testing. And actually, unit testing practices are uh, quite popular among all developers. So this is just the statistics from the general developers, not just C++. So like, uh, for 75% of all developers in the world say the testing plays an integral role in their development. And like 67% are using some kind of a unit test, which is kind of good. Um, and there are other t types of testing that people are also used to. If you look at the C++ world, so we have, uh, like in C and C++ both, we have several frameworks which are quite popular. So we have the, and we had actually the Google test, like we had them for ages. Um, they were like before, like pre-package management area, I would say even in its current form, in, in its current shape in C++, it was usually a pain to get Google test into your project because you had to find it, download it, put it into your project, compile with the proper flags, and they even had this FEQ at the Google test side when they were explicitly saying, please compile the whole library with your flags as you're doing it for your project so that you don't have any conflicts in terms of the compilation flags. Um, 
Like right now, I guess every decent package manager just that's the first thing they add, the Google test. But it's still not that easy. It's not just like one button pressed. Uh, but it works for like, and you can see for the majority of the C++ developers, and in 2022, even they have the big erasure uh, for a Google test. Catch is also there. But with the catch, I guess the story was, uh, when it was the header only, it was, I guess it was super popular. I saw how it was growing blazingly fast. Um, but with version two, like catch two 3.0, I guess like that's a creepy name for the version, but like yeah, catch two 3.0, they moved to the different distribution models. So like uh, they are distributing via the statically compiled library. So it's not header only anymore. They have their reasons. They do explain uh, in the release notes that they are kind of becoming more profound and they're adding more advanced features and they just don't want everyone to, you know, get it as a header included. So that's fine, but it looks like the developers who were using cache, they were quite often using it because it was header only and they were a little bit disappointed. So I'm not sure how it's gonna go further, but I see that the growth actually slowed down a little bit this year. Uh, boost test, uh, they are kind of still popular. Um, CPP units, someone is still using them. Doc test is there, but it's not that popular, but it's a good uh, you know, approach uh, because it's quite often considered as a, now as an alternative for catch, being a header only. And yeah, there was a great talk with a clean code yesterday, which I really enjoyed, and that's probably the direction we need. I mean, like, we probably need to have proper Mac-free uh, macro-free uh, unit testing framework, which is based on like reflection and introspection. The clean code, which was presented here at this conference yesterday, was exactly about that. There's an, an attempt to make a unit testing framework via the reflection, which is like macro-free approach. So, and it's good. Probably like we'll we'll get there one day, <laughs> hopefully. Um, just yeah, just do tests. Don't fall into this category. Um, and just the last thing, uh, since we were talking about the tasks, there are also, as a part of the tool set, there is also the code coverage tools. And you can do coverage in like different ways. You can do the line coverage, so calculating like how many lines of code are covered or in terms of the statements. Or you can do the branch coverage, where you just check uh, what's going on uh, through all the branches. And there are several like more or less standard tooling like LVM coverage and GCOF. Like one is mostly used with Clank and one is mostly used for GCC. You you can still use them like uh, GCAF, you can do via the Clank as well. Uh, they have different flags, so you just need to configure them properly. Uh, and you need to take into account some differences like GCAF and uh, LVM CAF, for example, they do take uh, compiler generated branches differently, like GCAF takes them into account. So you have to understand that if you're doing the branch coverage, you might get different results with LVM CAF and GCAF because GCAF will be taking compiler generated branches into account. So you just get different numbers. So you, you have to um, understand what you're doing. Uh, but that's generally kind of good advice. <laughs> so yeah, but the tools are kind of standard. I mean, like those who are trying to do coverage, like you can to the, uh, take them and get the result. OK, and probably just uh, the last one. Too long, don't read. Uh, so, uh, trying to summarize what we have currently in the C++ ecosystem. So do we have a standard C++ tool set? Not in the sense of like Swift or Rust, but we kind of have lots of tools which are more or less standard and commonly used for different use cases and sometimes that's kind of standard for this specific area. And like, do we miss some tools? Definitely yes, package managers is a good example or the macro-free unit testing framework, we probably have to do that. Um, can we unify more? For sure, there's also room for improvement and we can like integrate tools which, with each other and do a better job here. So, and yeah, this is mostly it. There are some links I have here and I will publish the presentation so you can just click these links and not you know, copy anything from here. And that's it. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, and like, if you have some questions, I guess we still have maybe a couple of minutes to answer, and then I can answer, you know, <laughs> privately. I think you can just raise your hand, and that, that guys, they have uh, microphones, so <laughs> feel free to ask. And like, I'm here at JetBrains booth, so if you have any questions, just feel free to come. I'll be happy to answer. I'm here for the whole day. 
Okay, then thank you and have a great day. <laughs>